Silly old board, thought Thomas. He had often tried to pass it, but had never succeeded. But this morning he had made a plan. The fireman went to throw the switch. Now for my plan, thought Thomas. Fire and smoke, said Thomas. I'm sunk! Thomas the Tank Engine has some pretty iconic classic episodes, episodes even casual fans can call to. Whether it's Thomas Comes to Breakfast or Thomas Gets Tricked, all being episodes we all can either remember or at least say we've heard of at some point. If you're an elite like me and grew up watching these episodes, you're already a step ahead. If you're growing up nowadays and watching Chuggington, you probably have a peanut allergy. One of these such episodes is Down the Mine, where Thomas, wanting to ignore a danger sign, has the cars help him further down the line. However, the track under Thomas gives way and he ends up falling into a chasm in the ground that was opened up by his weight. And of course, Gordon helps him out of the mine, everything ends up dandy, he's saved. But what most people may not know is that the events portrayed in this episode have actually happened. Like in real life. Like twice. Yes, on two separate occasions, very similar incidents happened that would later inspire the story of Down the Mine. It's not sure which of these events is what inspired the Reverend W. Audrey directly, as either event could equally have given the same inspiration for such. But for those who don't know the real and, in one case, terribly sad story of Down the Mine, let's get into it now. The Lindell Railway incident is probably the most popular out of these two. The incident itself happened on Thursday, September 22nd in 1892. Locomotive number 115, a D-Class 060, was shunting in the yard when its driver, coincidentally named Thomas Postlethwaite, saw cracks opening up in the ground below him. He would knock off steam before jumping clear of the locomotive with his firemen. When they looked back, all that remained was a deep 30-foot hole where the engine had once rested. While thankfully none of the original crew would sustain any injury, the entire track the engine sat on as well as the engine would fall into the crater. Breakdown gangs would successfully uncouple and pull clear a tender, but the locomotive being 35 tons alone meant that getting the entire thing out would be a tremendous task. At 2.30 p.m., the men working on clearing the locomotive would take a short break for refreshments. Not long after the work crew had cleared, however, the chasm would deepen again to 60 feet with the locomotive falling further still, by this point covering more than just one track and leaving most of them unsafe to use. The embankment was circled by a pattern of dips, indicating a history of subsidence. Shaky ground had already caused concerns requiring trains to slow down before crossing a nearby bridge. Two levels of mines sat beneath the railway. The top had been abandoned for some time, but the one below had miners that claimed that they could hear the engines above their heads. They had predicted amongst themselves that there would be a big spill someday. Unlike the events of Down the Mine, Locomotive 115 is still unfortunately in the hole, officially regarded as preserved with recovery only being a source of speculation. It's said by some that the locomotive may not be as far down as thought, thus meaning that recovery would be an option, but altogether a pricey one. It's unlikely that the engine will ever leave its now found tomb. Wow, Thomas, you really had it lucky, huh? You know, I always thought Sir Topham Hatt was kind of being a little bit too mean to Thomas in this episode, especially when, you know, Thomas does make his mistake. But after figuring these two events out, you know, the way that I did, it, it kind of makes a little bit more sense, you know? Like, I mean, sure, Thomas is crying, and you, you don't need to be a dick right now in this moment, Sir Topham, like, seriously, but I, I understand he probably cares. He probably thought that he was going to lose his engine. He's not just trying to be a dick to you, Thomas. It's because he cares about you. He doesn't, he doesn't want to see you get, you know... You know that! In all seriousness though, I myself find the real stories, if there ever are any behind Thomas episodes, super fascinating, and hopefully you guys did too. If there are any more episodes like this one that you guys think I should check out, be sure to let me know in the comments as I would be beyond down to make a series out of this. Honestly, I wanted to make this video after my own research and from being intrigued by what I found, so if there is more to find or more that you guys would like to see me talk about, be sure to let me know. I'll always love the classic series for all the memories and knowledge that it gave me, but it's facts and knowledge like this that brings a new dimension to the interest. Hopefully you guys enjoyed, and for your own sakes, follow the fucking science. It's not hard, G. Don't be an onion hit. Well, Gordon, said Sir Topham Hat, I knew you wanted a panoramic view, but this is not the way to achieve it. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. A better view for Gordon was 
I fucking conic. It may not be the most popular classic episode, but nonetheless, I really enjoyed the episode as a kid. There's also a lot that I find funny now, you know, like rewatching as an adult. Like how Sir Topham Hat wants to ride in Gordon's cab the first time going to the station, and then this happens, and then he has a coach. He was taking no fucking chances the second time, and I cannot blame him. This man came out looking like he got jumped or something. And while this episode is iconic for not only that, but the crash alone and just the situations that take place in it, some people may not know that this episode is actually loosely based off of real life events. Well, more one very hard to pronounce event. That being the Mont Parnesse derailment. Yeah, you see it now, don't you? If you're anything like me, you've seen this photograph plenty of times and had no idea that it had anything to do with this episode and probably feel really stupid right now. Well, actually, probably not. It was you guys who told me that this was a real event, and now nah, I'm the one who feels stupid. I'm the stupid one. It is you who holds the infinite wisdom. And thanks to him with the help of your all's infinite wisdom, that's what we're gonna get into today. The Mont Parnasse derailment would occur on October 22, 1895. The Granville Paris Express would overrun a buffer stop in the terminus. With the train several minutes late and the driver trying to make up for lost time, it would approach the station too fast and there would be a failure with the train's air brake. After failing to stop, the train would run through the buffer stop, cross the station concourse, and end up crashing through a station wall. The locomotive would fall onto the streets below where it would stand on its nose. As serious as the scene looks, there would only be one fatality, that of a woman in the street below who would be killed by falling masonry. The woman, Mary Augustina Gullard, had been standing in for her husband, a newspaper vendor while he went to collect the evening newspapers. The consist itself consisted of steam locomotive number 721, hauling three luggage vans, a post van, and six passenger coaches. Two passengers, the firemen, two guards, and a passerby in the street would also sustain injuries. Though still horrible and completely avoidable, it's lucky that only one life was lost. The driver of the large locomotive, a Type 240, French Notation 120, would be heftily fined and sentenced to two months in prison. One of the train's guards would also be fined, as he was preoccupied with paperwork and would overall fail to apply the handbrake. The railway company would settle with the family of the deceased woman, and arrange for the education of her two young children as well as proposing a future of employment for them. The passenger carriages were undamaged and easy to remove, however it would take 48 hours before the legal process and investigation would allow the railway to start removing the locomotive and tender. Overall meaning that for two days, this was what you could see if you went to the train station. An attempt was made to move the locomotive with 14 horses, but this overall would fail. A 250 ton winch with 10 men would first lower the locomotive to the ground. From there, the tender would be lifted back into the station. Despite how severe the scene may have looked, when the locomotive reached the railway workshops, it was found to have suffered very little damage. Not only serving as inspiration for this classic Thomas episode, a near identical train crash in the same location appears in the film adaptation of Hugo. And as I've said before, most people have seen this picture. I literally have a poster of this picture in my train room, like above my table, and I, I haven't known. Imagine my surprise. And looking at these photographs, it makes sense as to why Thomas and friends would be inspired to make an episode like that. The accident itself is iconic, and the episode that it was inspired by was too. The true story behind the accident itself is incredibly sad. To know that a woman, a mother lost her life just because of one driver's actions, that's just a reality that shouldn't have ever been. Not only was all of this damage avoidable, but overall kind of stupid. The images taken of this event will always be funny, but when you find out the real, you know, happenings of it all, it's kind of sad. However, I am happy to see that the railway actually did what they could to reimburse the family and that in some ways it didn't all end up, you know, fucked, and that at least somewhere in the story there is a silver lining. This ended up being one of those situations that in a way is bittersweet, but you know, it still worked out. While the original story behind the original accident is of course sad, and normally it is, I appreciate this episode even more for the inspiration that it drew from it. For more reasons than one, this episode is truly a classic, and now I know a little bit more about the crash, and I can appreciate even more about it. They kinda did right doing Gordon wrong, just saying. It, like most episodes featuring crashes with Gordon, took this untouchable-like character and brought him kinda, you know, down to earth, but took a very heavy situation and was able to bring it, you know, kinda down for children viewing while also respecting the actual event. Like, they, they did good, come on now. And this, like, are you kidding? Mwah, mwah, mwah. Beautiful art. Whether it was the toys inspired by the episode or the episode itself, there was a lot for us as kids to fall in love with here. In almost every way, this episode has cemented itself as a classic Thomas and Friends episode, and it will forever remain that. Now we just have a little bit more to appreciate as adults whenever we see it. And with all that being said, hopefully you guys enjoyed taking a look at the real story behind A Better View for Gordon. Look out! The brake van was in smithereens. Percy's driver and fireman had jumped clear, but Percy was stranded. <laughs> Percy.
Roxy's Predicament was one of those episodes that stuck out to me when I was a kid. One, because this episode managed to be amazing without even featuring Thomas in it. And two, the situation and, of course, Crash. Yeah, also f***. Classics. As I'm sure you could tell clicking on this video, Percy's Predicament is one of those episodes that shares a real life basis, or at least is inspired by real life events. In Thomas's absence, Daisy is brought to the branch line to help Percy and Toby. She ends up leaving some tankers of milk in the yard, which annoys Percy. Since they were left, Percy has to take an extra trip and go out of his way to deliver them. However, seeing how frustrated Percy is, Toby interjects and offers to take the tankers for him. The only stipulation being Percy has to take Toby's trucks. And he's like, fuck. Yeah, I'll take your trucks. And Percy sets off to the mine to collect them. However, when Percy arrives at the mine, he treats the trucks very poorly. He bumps and orders them around, and the trucks decide to make a plan. Collectively, the trucks agree to pay Percy back. Percy arranges his train, and as he's leaving, everything seems well. However, as trucks do, they end up pushing Percy. Because of this, Percy's not able to break and enters the yard going much too fast. Going so fast that the signalman wouldn't be able to direct him into a siding. Percy would then fly into the yard and run into the back of a brake van. Not only destroying it, but ending up on top of it, where Percy would then sit elevated above the rails. And that is how you make a flat car on the island of fucking Sodor. Apparently this happens the next day, but eventually Toby and Daisy show up to help Percy. Naturally, Sir Topham Hat does too to give Percy a good old scolding, and explains to Percy that he needs to be more careful before sending him off to be repaired. Of course, Sir Topham Hat would also have a word with Daisy explaining that she needed to stop being so fucking lazy, but says he'll give her another chance and everything ends up pretty okay. We even get to see Thomas return to the branch line at the end of the episode. We also were treated to Toby hauling Percy away in his very sorry state. Called it, I fucking called- I told you that's how they make flatbeds. And save for Percy everything ends up being pretty okay. While nothing that happened in this episode, at least to me, seemed too far-fetched, what ended up surprising me about the inspiration for this episode was how close the inspiration was to the actual episode. The entire wreck in the episode basically plays out the same way in real life, so much so that even just the picture of the wreck was just like, uh, wow, that's the exact same thing. And while there's not much to this story, it's definitely still a funny one. Not only that, but how identical the events actually are is, to me, pretty crazy. And that's the beauty of these classic fucking Thomas episodes. And with all that being said, let's jump into the true story of Percy's predicament. The image you're seeing here is originally from an old sketchbook notebook belonging to a man named Dompier Shaw, a one-time chief droughtsman at the works of London, Chatham, and Dover Railway. He would supply this image with the caption, Accident near Farnham Junction, April 13th, 1876. Engine mounted itself on goods trucks. Apparently, and as shown here, there was an end-on collision between two goods trains. The brake van of the stationary train, much like how seen in Percy's predicament, would collapse. The engine of the colliding train would be urged forward by the weight of the trucks behind it. The engine would climb over the wreckage and come to rest bolt upright on top of two coal trucks. The engine being LCDR number 123, a double-framed 060 Class H goods engine. Funnily enough, the engine itself was nicknamed Phyllis. Unfortunately, past this, not much is known about the accident. Or at least, personally, I wasn't able to find a whole bunch of information on this accident. We don't know if the brake van in which the engine would hit would be vacant, or if the driver and fireman would end up jumping clear. Though, presumably, everything seems to be alright, at least from what you can tell in the picture, which really isn't a lot. Really, all this image tells you is somebody probably got fired, somebody fucked. Up. But even just seeing this image alone to me is still funny. It's so visually spot on and honestly to me nostalgic. I see this image and of course I think of Percy's predicament and watching it as a kid. It's just funny to see that a similar situation actually occurred in real life. And while I'm not certain, even better to actually have a true story that doesn't involve somebody dying and is, you know, somewhat, from what I can tell, kind hearted in nature. As I've said before, there's a reason these classic Thomas and Friends episodes last, and why they have lasted. Whether you're young or old, a returning viewer or a new one, no matter who you are, there's something to fall in love with with all of these episodes. Perhaps it's the nostalgia from when you were younger and watching these episodes for the first time. Perhaps the accidents and the real-life stories behind them interest you. Or maybe the aesthetic and the storytelling in it just appeals to you. No matter what it is, there's always something that could draw you back into the episode. While this episode didn't have the most information behind it, and let me apologize for that right now, I wish I had more to tell you guys about it, I still appreciate the inspiration that the Reverend W would take from this. Honestly, I feel like the best part of some of these classic stories and original episodes is the inspiration that the Reverend W would take from seemingly anywhere. It's almost like any railroad accident occurrence, he could just turn it into a story. And having these stories rooted in reality is what made them so relatable. And in my opinion, what made Thomas stick out from literally any other kid show that was about trains. Truth be told, I could spend a lifetime whining about the classic Thomas and how much I miss it. And while I hate to admit it, those days are sadly behind us. Trust me, at this rate, it's unlikely that we are getting anything good from Mattel. Like, ever. Ever again. So, being able to go back and watch these episodes and find more reasons to fall in love with them and be inspired by them is what makes these Thomas and Friends episodes classics and so special. It really is a callback to a simpler time and to a time we all wish we could go back to. And while unfortunately those days are now behind us, that doesn't mean that these episodes still can't find ways to entertain you now. I'm happy to say that Percy's predicament is no such exception. Don't 
Douglas was grand, sir, said Edward. James had no steam left, but Douglas worked hard enough for three. I heard him from my yard. Two would have been enough, said Sir Topham Hatt. I want to be fair, Douglas, but I don't know. I really don't know. Donald and Douglas are my favorite twin characters on the island of Sodor. Not only the way they were voiced, but also their story intrigued me as a kid. Attempting to order a new engine, Sir Topham Hatt would receive Donald and Douglas as a pair. And Sir Topham Hatt tries to decide which one to send back, but both end up causing trouble in their own ways. The episode titled Donald and Douglas would also stand out to me as a kid. I really enjoyed the premise of Spiteful Break Fan and, well, when he gets fucked up, but also in the different situations that take place in the episode itself. For example, when Douglas has to help James up the hill, which is what causes the spiteful brake fan crash. But also when how Donald and Douglas treat the brake fan, and how it's said he treats them back. And of course, when Donald ends up running Tinder first into a signal box. None of the events alone were too crazy, but how Sir Topham Hatt would talk to Donald and Douglas and decide between the two would be interesting to me. Right when Sir Topham Hatt would end up choosing Donald to be the engine to stay, he ends up crashing into the signal box. Though Edward would try to explain why Douglas did what he did, Sir Topham Hatt would still be unsure of what Douglas had done, however, However, under fucking standably, and still be unsure as to which engine he should end up keeping. Spoiler alert, it's fucking both, ladies and gentlemen, but you knew that. And like how all stories on Sodor do, it ends up working out in the end. Albeit in another episode, however, but that's not what we're talking about today. Just like most classic Thomas and Friends stories, there is some real- It's not like this is an event that would be unheard of, but the source I would find would look so much like what happens in the episode that, in a way, kinda it makes up for the break fan part, at least to me. And with all that being said, let's get into the true story of Donald and Douglas. Also, like Percy's predicament, I really wasn't able to find a lot of information behind this picture. The inspiration is just very clearly there, and I don't really have to tell you much. But I'm sure you're thinking what exactly happened to, you know, make this shit take place. And let me explain. The image you're seeing here and the text you're about to hear is from Trains in Trouble Volume 2 by Arthur Trevina. On July 20th, 1959, the driver of Jubilee number 45730 was backing down from St. Pancras Station to the MPD at Kentish Town when he missed a signal at danger. Because of this, to protect the main line, the points have been set into a short dead-end spur. This would result in the engine colliding tender first into the signal box, as you can very clearly see here. Hand signaling would then be enforced into and out of the station. This would be for several days until the signal box could be repaired. Thankfully, from what I can tell in my research, nobody was hurt or injured in this accident. You would figure that somebody got fucking fired, but I, I couldn't find anything on that either. Unfortunately, this would be where my sources would end, so I wasn't able to figure out any more about, you know, the true story behind it or what would happen following that. But even just by looking at this picture, you can see the inspiration that Reverend W would take himself. Just look at the original RWS illustrations. There's really not much more that needs to be said. It's no coincidence that the most popular and recognized at that point you automatically create a connection. And it was the ability of the show to be able to hold these real life situations in the way that it did that would inspire and create the love for trains that a lot of people have. It's this that the show lacks and misses so much now. And ladies and gentlemen, the consequences are fucking dire. And the more information that I find out that Reverend W was inspired by, the more I'm actually able to appreciate these older episodes. As I've said before, any occurrence, accident, anything that could happen on a railway, the Reverend W could turn it into a story. It was an infinite amount of creativity that inspired infinite amounts of creativity, and still get all the facts right, and to take inspiration from so many different other places and outlets. It really is what made the classic series so special. I almost feel a little bit of irony in the fact that this situation is somewhat based in reality. Just for the simple fact that I always noticed how serious and heavy Sir Topham Hatt was on Donald and Douglas. I always felt as if the way he talked to them and just the situation itself was a bit heavy for Thomas and friends. Not like they're afraid to go there, like fuck no. And then to find out on top of that that there is a little bit of reality in the situation, and despite all of that, they were able to still put it all into a kid's show and make it amazing. It really drives home the fact that there will always be something to be interested in with these episodes. I'm happy to say that the true story of Donald and Douglas is, again, no exception. Cheer up, Henry. It wasn't your fault. Ice and snow caused the accident. I'm sending you to Crew, a fine place for sick engines. They'll give you a new shape and a larger firebox. You'll feel a different engine, and you won't need special coal anymore. Won't that be nice? Yes, sir, said Henry. The 
Flying Kipper is a Thomas and Friends classic. Of course, it's also a classic Thomas and Friends episode, but that goes in two different ways. Of course, the episode alone is very memorable for everything that happens in it and just for being overall beautiful. Just look, just look, look at these shots. Are you kidding me? That's some S rank, um, everything. But also in the fact that this episode is based directly off a book from the Reverend W. Audrey, also being titled The Flying Kipper. It's pretty obvious and pretty fair to say that this episode and story really sticks out. In the episode, the accident is portrayed pretty graphically, but not in a bad way, more in a, oh, wow. Much like how in A Better View for Gordon, we would see the first time Sir Topham had or a crew would get hurt in any situation, I would argue that this is the first time that we really see an engine get hurt in a crash. So much so that, as you all saw, Henry ends up getting sent to crew to be overhauled. Of course, that's not the only reason that Henry was sent to crew. It's known and said in the show that Henry has a lot of problems. It's said that he wasn't built right and can only perform well with special Welsh coal. So it's more accurate to say that this was the tipping point for Sir Topham Hatt to send him to get his overhaul. Henry, of course, would come back with a larger firebox and a new shape. Overall, a new engine and feeling in the best shape that he's ever been in. Truly a heartwarming, just just wonderful tale. Kind of sucks that he had to go through this for Sir Topham Hatt to be like, yeah, it's time. Not only that, but there are three people in the brake van that Henry inevitably, you know, destroys. And of course, they get out just in time. But could you imagine? That would be a great bonus episode. Basically, due to the snow that had recently fallen on the tracks, a switch on Henry's line ends up getting locked up. Of course, the snow weighs down on the signal arm and Henry doesn't know. Because of this, Henry would end up continuing down the line and run into the back of another train. Not his best or happiest story, but it works out in the end. There were accidents before this, but I would argue that they weren't really as heavy. For example, there is James's accident in Thomas and the Breakdown Train, which is a classic as well. And while it is implied that James is hurt, it's not implied that he needs an entire, you know, overhaul. And that's what makes me think this episode was more of a first in terms of the engines really getting hurt in an accident. At least in a way that really shows. Of course, being a classic Reverend W. Audrey story, it is inspired by real life events. You also read the title and pressed on- you know this, you know that. You know why we're here. And thanks to your all's recommendations and some tips, I was actually able to find out a little bit more information on what exactly the event was. And thanks to your guys' help, that's what we're going to get into today. The Abbott's Ripton Rail accident would take place on January 21st in 1876. Just like in the Flying Kipper, snow and ice would be a growing problem on the Great Northern Railway. In the accident, the special Scotch Express train would collide with a coal train during a blizzard. Following this, an express train traveling in the other direction would run into the wreckage. The initial accident itself was caused by over-reliance on signals and block working, as well as a systematic signal failure in the adverse conditions of the snow. To basically put that in English, just like in the Flying Kipper, snow had been weighing down on the signals and visibility was limited due to the snow. The collision would involve three locomotives, 13 people would end up losing their lives, another 53 people would end up injured. The accident itself and the inquiry into it led to a fundamental change in the British railway signaling practice, to this day remaining one of the worst and most unfortunate collisions in the history of railways and railroads. A coal train preceding the Flying Scotsman on the main East Coast line was normally scheduled to be shunted into a siding at Abbott's Ripton. This would allow the much faster Flying Scotsman to pass. However, because of the snowstorm, both the coal train and Flying Scotsman were running late. The signalman at home, the next station north of Abbott's Ripton, judged that the coal train needed to go into the siding at home if it was not to delay the Flying Scotsman. He therefore would set his signal levers to danger as to stop the coal train, but it would continue on the main line until reaching Abbott's Ripton. Using a hand lamp, the signalman would wave the locomotive to shunt. The goods train had nearly completed shunting when the Scotsman Express would run into it with some speed. The wreckage would obstruct the downline. A second collision would occur some minutes later, when a northbound express train to Leeds would crash into the wreckage. Thirteen passengers would die in the collisions, and fifty-three passengers and six train crew members would also be injured. The weight of the snow on the arm of the signal, or perhaps ice building up on the signal's wires, had meant that when the signalman had put the levers to all danger, the signals would not fully move into the danger position. In normal conditions, signalmen could see the signals that they were controlling. However, in the snowstorm, they could not. The southbound coal train had left Peterborough about 18 minutes late, therefore with 12 minutes less of a lead than normal on the Flying Scotsman. It progressed steadily to Abbott's Ripton where it was stopped by the signal box. Under the instructions of the signalman, the coal train will begin to shunt. The signalman would urge the driver to hurry up, claiming that he was keeping the Scotchman standing at Wood Walton, being the previous signal box. As stated before, the signalman at home had been concerned that because the coal train was so late, if it went on to Abbott's Ripton before shunting into a siding, the Flying Scotsman would be delayed. To avoid this, he had decided to stop the train at home and put it into a siding there. He would set his signals to danger, However, when the coal train arrived at home, it would not stop. 
He telegraphed to Abbott's Ripton that the train had run past the signals, and told the station master at home that the train had disobeyed them. The home station master told the inquiry that he would then send for plate layers. Whilst waiting for them, he would check the upline home signal and saw that it would be set to danger. However, when a down express went through, he would notice that one of the signals did not go to danger. The plate layers had to be sent for because they had been allowed to go home at the end of their normal working day, despite the weather. Their foreman was uneasy about this, however, and would come out of his house to watch the up-distance signal while two trains went past. The first of these was the Manchester Express, running about 13 minutes behind the Scotsman. The second, a slow stopping passenger train, a further 6 minutes behind. As he feared, the signal showed a white light throughout. He put his work clothes back on and went to the signal. The arm was weighed down with snow, and once he had shaken this off by working the arm up, it would then show a red light. He then walked to the station. On his way, he met a plate layer dispatched to the distant signal by the station master. The Scotch Express would leave Peterborough about six minutes late. It wouldn't slow down speed for the bad weather. It would pass through home at about 6.37, with the signal showing all clear. It would arrive at Wood Walton at 6.40. The signalman there had set his signal levers to danger, and had done this to protect the shunting at Abbott's Ripton. However, he did not set his levers to set detonators at the home signal, nor did he supplement his fixed signals by displaying a hand lamp from the signal box. He told the inquiry he was busy stopping a train of empty coal wagons on the downline, and because of this, as well as the weather, he did not hear the express until it ran past his cabin at full speed. It would hit the coal train going at full speed, about 40 to 45 miles per hour. Some coal wagons would end up smashed, but the coal train engine itself was largely unscathed. The express train would derail and veer off to the right. It ended up lying on its side, beyond the downline. Its tender and two passenger carriages would also obstruct the downline. The railway workers involved were badly shaken, some would admit it took them a few minutes to fully gather their wits. But the guards whose duty it was to protect their train were affected to a lesser extent. The guard of the express would walk back the upline, towards Wood Walton, laying fog signals on the rails to warn any further trains to stop. Despite the signal showing all clear, the Manchester Express would stop in response to the Wood Walton signalman using a hand lamp to show a red light from a signal box. It finally pulled up beyond the Wood Walton down distant signal. The Abbott's Ripton up distant signal could be seen up ahead showing the white all clear. It then proceeded cautiously towards Abbott's Ripton. The train would be stopped constantly, first by the Scotsman guard waving a red hand lamp and then by a plate layer. Eventually, it would draw up on the rear of the wrecked Scotsman. The Abbott's Ripton signalman was evidently dazed by the events. He would set his signals in both directions to danger, but did not immediately send the five-beat obstruction danger bell signal to Stukeley, that being the next signal box south. Instead, he would try to telegraph Huntington, thus trying to report the crash and seeking assistance. He would continuously try to raise Huntington, but the signalman did not answer, as he refused to accept any messages not starting with a code to indicate the time sent. He would rebuke with an MQ code roughly translating as, Go away, I'm busy. And indeed he was, as he was accepting the Leeds Express and passing it on to the next signal box. At 6.52, after trying and failing for 8 minutes to pass his message, the Abbott's Ripton signalman would send the 5-beat obstruction danger bell to Stukeley. The Down Leeds Express would pass through Huntington at 6.49. The Abbott's Ripton down signal was showing all clear, and the Leeds Express would approach it at full speed. Still traveling at full speed, the Leeds Express would plow through the tender and the carriages blocking the line. This, rather than the first collision, is when most of, if not all of the deaths are thought to have occurred. The inquiry in court would overall blame snow and ice for the events that had taken place. However, after the accident, the GNR would adopt a significantly different design of signals, that being a semaphore or a somersault signal. The modern practice of the default position for signals being danger was also adopted, and railway companies were required by law to make an annual return to the Board of Trade on what fraction of their passenger rolling stock was fitted with continuous brakes. Over a larger time scale, continuous braking will be fitted to all passenger trains. That and the all clear was indicated by a green light, so that a broken red lens or one out of position would no longer give false reassurance. The Board of Trade would have no regulatory powers to enforce the recommendations of the inquiry report, the most important being improving signals so that they would work in the frost and snow, keeping signals normally at danger, the use by signalmen of hand lamps in bad weather to confirm the indications of fixed signals, the provision of telegraph apparatus in all signal boxes, the improvement of braking systems on all trains, as well as the suspension of less important trains and the reduction in speed of other trains in severe weather conditions. I don't know if it's just me, but Basically, everything that was just said there was common sense, or should be on a railway. It's sad that this had to happen for these basic rules to be taken seriously. 
Just like the accident in the original episode of the Flying Kipper, the real story behind it is quite intense. While the original Flying Kipper accident doesn't involve a three-train pile-up, it's still very interesting to see the real-life inspiration that they took in taking and making this story. Everybody loved how seriously the crash itself was portrayed in the original episode. It's even more interesting to find out what inspired that episode, and in most cases, unfortunately, oftentimes a lot more sad, but still. It's not like this information ruined this episode for me, but it definitely adds a little bit more of a different dimension to it. Already considered a dark episode, when you figure out the real-life dark counterparts of what really happened, it makes it even more so. But even still, in my opinion, this episode is still one of the most visually appealing. That and the happy ending is always going to be a heartwarmer. It's always great to see that, you know, our boys end up okay at some point. Though the original situation the episode is drawn from is dark, I have to commend the show for, again, being able to take this heavy situation and, you know, dumb it down for kids. I don't think any of us would have any idea, as kids watching this, the real, true, and crazy story behind it. We didn't even have to think about it. What happened to Henry was honestly, you know, sad enough. But as I've said before, and I'll say again, being able to have this information now as an adult and re-watching this, it really makes you appreciate it just a little bit more. It's evident through this and through different situations in Thomas that it would treat its fan base very maturely for its age. And it's finding out information like this that really adds to that. Because of this, there will always be something to appreciate in these classic Thomas and Friends episodes. More than just being called classic makes them so. And it's almost like the more information we find out about these episodes, the more special they can become to us. The Flying Kipper, of course, is no exception. If there's anything else you guys would like to see me talk about, be sure to let me know down in the comments. This video wouldn't have been possible without your guys' recommendations and help, and I can't thank you guys enough for that. And even more so, thank you guys for continuing to support this series. So many of you commented asking to see the real story of the Flying Kipper and giving me the information I would need to find it, as well as a bunch of other recommendations and ideas, and I can't thank you guys enough for it. It's always a blast being able to bring you guys the content that you want to see. Again, if you guys have any more recommendations, be sure to let me know down in the comments, and hopefully you guys like taking a look at the true story of the Flying Kipper. They telephoned Sir Topham Hatt. So Gordon didn't want to take the special train and ran into a ditch? What's that you say? The special's waiting? Tell Edward to take it, please, and, and Gordon, leave him where he is. We'll get him out later. Silly old Gordon fell in a ditch, fell in a ditch, fell in a ditch. Silly old Gordon fell in a ditch all on a Monday morning. Takes a Dip is episode 24 from Thomas and Friends season 1, being one of those episodes that's born a fucking classic. Naturally so, because it's an RWS story. They just retitled it for TV. The bastards. And also totally missed out on Gordon's Frogs. I would've loved that playset. And being an RWS story and written by the Reverend W. Audrey, one could probably guess that this story is based in real life in some way. Even without knowing that it's a classic RWS story, it kinda makes sense. I don't know if it's just me, but knowing what I know about humans, I could see one of us fucking up and running a train into a ditch. There's nothing that we are not capable of. And that's basically what happens in the story, except that Gordon's fault. Henry is kind of provocative to Gordon in the yard, and because of this, Gordon keeps going on about Henry's accident, that being the flying kipper. He gloats to the other engines about how proper he is and how he's never been in a wreck himself, and when it's Henry's turn to pull the express, Gordon taunts him when he leaves, saying that he should be careful not to come off of the rails. Following this, however, Gordon is tasked to pull some trucks, and he's like, fuck no, I'm not pulling no fucking trucks, and ends up being slow to start, so Edward helps him to a turntable. Upon actually getting to the turntable, Gordon's fire starts to start up a little bit more, and in an attempt to jam the turntable, Gordon starts forward and isn't able to stop, thus landing him in a ditch. Following this, his driver and fireman let him know how stupid the decision he made was, and Sir Topham Hatt surveying the scene from his office would not only make plans around what Gordon had done, but ultimately decide to leave him there for the day. Later that night, two cranes and James would help Gordon not only out of the ditch, but into the sheds. And just like every Thomas and Friends episode, in the end it ends out alright. Gordon may be embarrassed, but you know, at least he's okay. Would have been kind of funny if Sir Top of Matt left him though. Now, as stated before being an RWS story, there is some real life basis to what happens in the actual episode. Like most RWS stories, the Reverend W. Audrey would take inspiration from a real life event and then using his characters would turn it into a story. A lot of you guys recommended me to talk about and look into this episode, and like I always am, I was really interested with what I was able to find. Hopefully, you guys find it interesting as well. And with all that being said, here's the true story of Gordon Takes a Dip, or Off the Rails.
What we're going to be taking a look at today and what you're actually looking at now is the newspaper article that would report this accident. It's titled Railway Engine Runs Off Turntable, though the event itself is referenced as Engine Number 43132 Takes the Wrong Turn at Lynn. 43132, a 90-ton 4MT engine, actually being a 260 Ivic class LMS mogul from 1947, was supposed to take a 1230 train from South Lynn to Yarmouth. Driver B. Fisher and Fireman D. Hudson were operating the turntable. They would have the engine about halfway around when it would begin to move forward off of the turntable. The engine would then go down a 7-foot embankment, becoming buried in a ditch. You mean to tell me one of you all couldn't just be like, yeah, let's check the fucking brakes? Now, note that there are some inconsistencies between the accounts of this event. For example, the number of the locomotive, which in some cases is 43142, the actual depth of the plunge, which has been reported between 4 to 5 feet rather than 7, as well as the method of rescue, which would be by crane. But there also are some similarities. Either way, it's clear somebody probably got fired here. But thankfully, it looks like that's about as bad as it gets, minus, you know, the inclusion of almost losing an engine. It's funny to see how this mistake between a driver and fireman would inspire the Reverend W. Audrey to create his classic story. I've said about a million times now how I commemorate the Reverend W. Wadri for being able to turn any railway event into a story. At a time, Thomas and Friends wasn't about making money as a franchise. It was about creating or getting across a story or point. And that being the point is what makes these classic episodes, well, what they are classics all around. And since these episodes and stories are based in reality and you can search these things up, this adds an entire new layer of interest to the fans. Even if you don't care for the Thomas and Kid part of it, you can always appreciate that these things actually happened. However, if you are a fan of Thomas and Friends, things like this result in a level of appreciation. And it's these episodes that we always will appreciate. Nobody likes where Thomas is going now, but at least there truly are an infinite amount of things that we can appreciate with what we did have. As always, Gordon Takes a Dip is no exception. Thank you guys for watching. Duck surveyed the damage. Hello, Oliver. Are you being a good, gracious engine? Beg pardon, but we really don't like this sort of surprise. to say that recently I've been on a little western kick. After modeling my scrap toad and rewatching Escape, and consequently drawing up plans for a scrap Oliver, I don't even own a fucking Bachman Oliver, I never have. I'm gonna be buying the boy to break him. And after watching some episodes for inspiration, as I've considered actually modeling the little western recently, I just haven't got around to doing it. One episode stuck out to me in particular, and it's one that did when I was a kid as well. And that episode is Oliver Owns Up. I would argue that this episode probably poses the best visuals for the Arlesboro branch line that we ever got. The entire set itself is just fucking amazing, but Duck and Oliver basically get an episode to themselves. We even got to see Donald, even though Douglas was nowhere to be found in this episode for some reason. So right off the bat, you have an elite cast, but combine that with a beautiful set, and it's an adaption of the Railway series, so yeah, this story's a special one. But it's not just these three points that make this episode special. As I'm sure you guessed by the title of this video, there's actually a true story behind the events of Oliver Owns Up. When Oliver falls into the turntable in this episode, it by no means feels out of the realm of possibility. And that's because being an RWS book and written by the Reverend W. Audrey, it actually comes from reality. Of course, as I always am, I was interested by what I was able to find. And thank you to everybody who recommended me to check this one out as well. I really wasn't expecting a lot going into it, but boy oh boy was I wrong. With all that being said, let's finally jump into the true story of Oliver Onza. Which one of you drunk motherfuckers? Jokes aside though, the image we're looking at is called Off the Road at Backup Shed, taken from Steam World issue 229. A very clear misjudgment had left the locomotive at a dramatic angle after plunging into the turntable pit. Though it's hard to see, the text on the image is as follows. Close examination of this picture shows recovery underway. To the right is a breakdown train, while behind a man is moving timber bulks into the pit. Presumably the rear of the locomotive will be raised by jacks, allowing it to be pulled free. The angle of the locomotive suggests that it was traveling at a relatively low speed when it fell into the pit. It it really is funny because from this angle, this locomotive really does kind of look like Oliver, especially when you put it beside the RWS pictures. What's also notable is if you look at the RWS pictures, you'll see Donald and Douglas right here. Now here's the same event but from a different angle. Even the recovery engine looks like Donald or Douglas, although all we know for sure about the engines is that one is a 242 and one is an 060. The text on this image is as follows. Neither the date of the accident or details of the locomotive involved are recorded on these pictures, submitted by Stefan Spencer, who says the prints were given to me many years ago by Colin Cook. We worked together as ambulance men 
Mr. Cook's father, David Cook, was a fireman at Backup Shed and could have taken these pictures. In LMS days, an LNY242T has fallen into the turntable pit at Backup. The locomotive is fully cold, and it might have been left slightly in gear and run away, or the accident could have been the result of misjudgment by the crew. The locomotive's number, though partially obscured, is a part of the 107XX series, that of which Backup had had four at various times between 1935 and 1939. However, it could be from another shed, such as Bury, which has the same number in the same series, making our lives that much more complicated. The bottom image shows an 060 coupled to a breakdown train, which is shielding the view from the passenger trains on the right. Yes, literally, apparently they tried to use this engine to cover up the f up that they made with this engine. Little did they know they'd still make it into my YouTube video one day, and go on to inspire one of the most iconic episodes in Thomas and Friends. The Little Western will always be a favorite of mine. From the characters to the location itself, there's so much to appreciate when you take into account everything that the Arlesboro line has to offer. And it's no coincidence that I felt the same way as a kid. One of the big things about the Little Western is that it's different. Not only does it have a great roster of characters, but visually it's so different from everywhere else on the island of Sodor. And it's so interesting, at least to me, to see what the Reverend W would take to create this. It's not like the accident that takes place in the episode is crazy by any means, but nonetheless it was something that I could actually see happening and presented a realm of reality to the Thomas and Friends world. That truly becomes deepened when you find out that it actually really did happen. And seeing the RWS picture side by side to the actual event, not only is it kind of funny, but honestly kind of inspirational. To think that this and this, just basic railway fuck-ups you would think, inspired one of my favorite episodes of all time. It feels especially better to bask in it now, given the fact that they recently confirmed that Oliver would be in the reboot and his model is fuck terrible let me show you guys <laughs> Jokes aside though, hopefully you guys did enjoy, and thank you again to everybody who commented on the last video suggesting that I check this episode out. Not only did I get to bask in a little bit of my childhood again, but now have newfound inspiration and knowledge that I can use to appreciate Thomas and Friends even more. Thank you guys for watching. James turned much too easily. The wind puffed him round like a top. He couldn't stop. Tinders and turntables. Not one of my favorite episodes when I was a kid, but still an iconic one nonetheless. It's not that there's anything wrong with this episode, I'd just be a liar if I said it was one of those ones that really stood out to me when I was a kid. Well, other than for the reason that, well, You've probably seen the episode, you know the reason. But on the chance you haven't seen this episode, let me give you a quick rundown. The big engines, being Henry, Gordon, and James, are finding themselves tired and what they would call overworked. With Thomas and Edward now being busy on a branch line, they're now forced to get their coaches and freight cars themselves, something that the big engines claim is beneath them. To accommodate the big engines, being tender engines, Sir Topham Hat would end up building two turntables on either side of the line so that they could be turned around with relative ease. However, the engines have to be balanced on the turntable just right for it to perform properly. And one day, Gordon claiming that he's more important than Thomas for having a tender, Gordon would arrive at one of these turntables and, still upset from earlier and not really caring about what he's doing, would give his crew and the turntable operators a little bit of trouble in getting him into place. Gordon's lack of effort and the combination of the high winds that day leave the workmen basically unable to turn him around. And as a result, Gordon has to pull the express backwards, something that Thomas and everybody jokes about calling him a tank engine. James would pass by and see this and make fun of Gordon even more, leading him to feel quite prideful and Gordon to feel more indignant. James would then go back to the turntable to get into the sheds, coincidentally at the same time that Gordon would come back. Again, all James originally wanted to do was get turned around. However, much to his horror and Gordon's amusement, the wind would start to pick up and James would start basically doing a spinjitsu. The turntable would spin him quite unforgivably, so much so that it visibly makes him sick, leaving Gordon the chance to crack a joke back at James, and now leaving James more than feeling indignant to say the least. That night, the engines would confide with each other, each one agreeing that the treatment that they had been receiving was unjust, claiming that tender engines shouldn't have the responsibilities that they do. The three then planned to go on strike. While not being a really in-depth story, it is one of those stories that's a classic from the Reverend W. Audrey, so it does have some real-life basis behind it. While I wasn't able to find as much as I would normally like, I was still able to locate quite a bit of substantial inspiration that the Reverend W. could have taken in writing this story. With all that being said, let's take a look at the possible real story of Tenders and Turntables.
While it wasn't common for engines to go on strike, at a time it was fairly common for the drivers to, and that was around the 1950s. It was also fairly common for an engine to either stick a turntable or fall into it. However, the element of the story is an engine getting spun on a turntable, and this would be inspired by an event that would take place at the now Garsdale Junction. The wording of the original incident report is as follows. December 21st, 1900, from the settle inspector of Mr. Silcock. As the pilot engine number 1310 was turning on the turntable this morning, the wind being so strong caused the engine to get beyond control. It's unclear how long the engine will be spinning for and if the crew was inside of it. Apparently sandbags were used to stop the turntable spinning, and as a result of this incident it would be stockaded with a wall of sleepers, as this would happen to at least one other turntable on the Highland Railway. What you're looking at now is a 242T locomotive, specifically LMS number 10899, and this is actually sitting on the famous Garsdale turntable. The new added sleepers would now protect engines from the strong winds. The turntable this actually happened on still survives to today, and now turns locomotives at the Kayleen Worth Valley Railway. Now if only we could get a doubt with Thomas event where they would take a James locomotive and just spin it uncontrollably on it. I'd be down for that shit. I know you all will be too. I've done my best to look around, but I haven't been able to find a picture of the actual pilot engine, number 1310, the one that was supposedly spun around on the turntable in the fashion that James was. However, the Midland Railway Class 115s were referenced several times in my efforts to actually find a picture of that locomotive. It's not exactly James's class, but if this were to be one of the engines that did it, I could see it looking close enough. At least enough for Reverend W to make a story out of it. Just like I said before, tenders and turntables wasn't necessarily a favorite to me when I was a kid, but having the ability to rewatch it and now appreciate it a little bit more with the knowledge that I have, I find the pettiness of the big engines and just their overall attitude to the situation honestly funny and a lot more accurate. I wish this was something that they actually maintained in current Thomas. However, besides that, you have to again give points to the Reverend W for being able to take such an event and make it into such an iconic episode and story. If there's any classic Thomas and Friends episode that I would argue shows the real attitude that Gordon once had, it would definitely be this one and it's not just him. The superior complex of all the big engines really shows in this episode. And James getting spun like he's a fucking Beyblade? You can't tell me that's not iconic. And just like I always am, I find myself impressed with the Reverend W for being able to take such a seemingly basic story and do so much more with it. Tinders and Turntables is once again one of those episodes that's no exception. Thank you again to everybody who voted in the last poll, letting me know that I should do this for my next true story. It came down to this one or Percy Runs Away, so expect that one for the next one. I was able to find quite a bit of information that could have inspired that story, so if you voted in favor of that episode, no worries, it is coming. If there's any other stories you guys think I should check out, be sure to let me know down in the comments. And once again, hopefully you guys like taking a look at the true story of Tinders and Turntables with me. Thanks again for watching. Waiting for the signalman to set the switch so he could get back to the yard. Percy was being rather careless and not paying attention. Edward had warned Percy, be careful on the main line, whistle to the signalman that you were there. But Percy didn't remember to whistle, and so the busy signalman forgot him. Percy waited and waited. The switch was still against him, so he couldn't move. Then he looked along the main line. Beep! Beep! He whistled in horror. Percy Runs Away was an episode that I was surprised to find out had a true story behind. However, being one of those classic episodes I really should have known by now, and despite what the intro may have made you think, the event that would inspire this story is actually kind of funny, opposed to being normally sad or tragic, which is, you know, normally how these go, and honestly in a way kind of interesting. In the episode itself, Thomas, Percy, and Edward are shunting some trucks in the yards. However, Thomas goes off with Annie and Clarabelle and Edward is sent to the quarry, meaning it's just Percy who has to take the freight cars down. At this point in the show, Percy is, I guess what you could call, still infantile, and doesn't exactly know his way around the road. Away. After dropping off some trucks, he ends up stopping at a signal box. It's at this point that Percy is supposed to whistle at the signalman to let him know that he's there, being something that Edward had actually told him. However, Percy ends up forgetting to do so, and much to his horror, he is then met with Gordon barreling towards him on the same line that he's on. Percy's crew ends up jumping clear, and Gordon actually ends up stopping right before Percy, and of course is annoyed, but before he can say anything to Percy, Percy ends up throwing it in reverse and just takes off running. He's so scared that he ends up going completely over Gordon's hill without even noticing, and isn't stopped until he's intentionally derailed and sent into a siding. Of course, Percy's not hurt, and neither is Gordon. Gordon actually is the one who ends up coming back to save Percy. I guess he felt bad. I, I mean, I would too if I scared somebody that much. And Percy ends up getting pulled out of the embankment and everything ends up okay. What's funny is the events that actually took place in real life aren't too crazy far off from this. And I know what you're thinking. How the hell does a train run away? And that's actually what we're going to talk about now.
accidentally lied to you guys. It turns out that there's two different events that could have inspired this episode. And in a way, I'm actually kind of thankful for that, seeing as there's not a whole lot of information in the first story. However, what is known is the locomotive, that being engine number 1466 of the Great Western Railway. In 0402 14XX, like Oliver is, and actually is the engine that you're looking at now, currently being preserved at the Didcot Railway Center. The engine would happily be waiting on the main line for clearance from the signalman to leave. Unfortunately, the signalman wasn't aware of the engine's presence, however. As consequence, an express train had actually been rooted onto the same line. Upon seeing the oncoming express, the fireman would jump clear and the driver would try to move the engine. The express would end up hitting 1466 and knocking the driver out of the cab. This, however, also would set the engine in motion. 1466 would run driverless down the main line backwards for 7 miles. Eventually, the locomotive itself would be intentionally derailed. The location and event is dated to Newton Abbott in 1939. I guess in a way not as much is known about the second one. Despite there being a tad bit more information on what actually happened in the event itself, I wasn't actually able to find a picture of the locomotive that was involved. What is known is that the locomotive itself was an 060T. This would take place on the old Somerset and Dorset Railway on the 29th of July in 1936. A freight train hauled by a 280 locomotive had just passed through some signals at danger in the vicinity of a local signal box, not too far from Radstock. It came into a slight collision with the 060T locomotive, that being locomotive number 7620, which was engaged in shunting duties. In anticipation of the crash, the crew of the 280 would actually jump clear of the locomotive. The driver of the 060T, also realizing what was about to happen, would then start the train to reverse and then leap off. His fireman would do the same, leaving the regulator just slightly open. The driver then managed to clamber onto the now almost stationary 280 locomotive and would bring it to a halt. The 060T, however, would unfortunately roll off, minus its crew. The locomotive itself had a consist of eight wagons in front of it, and now was picking up speed while also encountering different gradients. By the time the runaway train would reach Midford, some five miles away, most of the wagons that were attached to the train had actually been thrown off of the tracks, and because of this it actually caused quite a bit of damage, even going as far as to partially wreck a signal box, as well as different station buildings at Midford. Fortunately, the eventual derailment of the last wagon had actually brought the engine to a standstill, this actually taking place right before it would stall a major junction. Just like I stated previously, though I shouldn't have been, I was pretty surprised to find a true story behind this episode. Everything that takes place in it just seems so, I don't know, I guess perfect for the Thomas universe. When you think of a runaway train, you normally don't think of a train actually, you know, kind of running away. So to know that this episode does have a real life basis, as well as how close the real life basis is to the episode, it really is something. I stand by the fact that the Reverend W. Audrey could turn anything into a story for trains, so long as it actually featured them. This episode not only stuck out to me, but I'm sure stuck out to a lot of you all as a kid, so hopefully this little bit of extra information can help you appreciate it just a little bit more. If there's any other episodes you guys think I should check out, be sure to let me know down in the comments. And thank you guys again for watching. See you guys in the next one. Next, his driver and farm and jumped clear as he rolled over. No one was hurt. His coach stayed on the rails and the guard braked her to a stop. They brought Godred home next day. We've no money to mend you, said our manager, so you'll go to the back of the shed. As time went on, poor Godred got smaller and smaller till nothing was left. What, what, what happened? asked Duncan anxiously. It's not nice to talk about, said Caldy. The Coldy Fell engines were always some of my favorites as a kid, which in retrospect is kind of strange seeing as they never made it to the TV series. However, as a kid, I had a RWS collection book, and in that book was not only these engines' illustrations, but also their stories. One of these stories, which I have vivid memories of, is Bad Lookout. And to grossly oversimplify the story, here's kind of how it goes. One day, Duncan ends up in a bad mood, this being because the thin controller says that he keeps a bad lookout. So, Scarlo and Renee has changed the subject of the conversation by asking Coldy about his coaches. However, the conversation soon shifts to Coldy's automatic brakes, and the story of Godred an engine who happened to have too much faith in his automatic brakes. Despite frequent discipline, Godred would continue in his ways. Eventually, Godred would not only fall off of the track, but down the mountainside. Since the manager had no money to repair Godred, he was put in the back of the shed, where, over time, the drivers would cannibalize him, using him for spare parts to mend Coldy and the other engines. Sir Handel and Duncan are understandably mortified, while Scarlo and Reneas do not mention that the tale was made up. Yeah, it turns out Coldy was bullshit. However, what's unfortunately not made up is the inspiration for the story. Sure, the Coldy Fell engines are weird, 
weird, and the fact that they have faces on the back of them is something that definitely interested me. But even more so, the stories around these engines always felt so real. This can partly be attributed to the fact that these engines are based off of real ones, but even more so in their storytelling. Hopefully after hearing all of this, you'll be able to see it a little bit too. With all that being said, let's get into the true story of Bad Lookout. The accident would happen on the Snowden Mountain Railway, the actual real-life inspiration for the Coldy Fell, in 1896 on April 6th, its opening day. The engine this would happen to was number one, known as Lattis or Latis. Apologies, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Following another engine up the summit with a few coaches, and while all went well on the up trip, on the down trip things would take a turn for the worst. Due to the thawing of some frost, there was a clear subsidence in the track bed. This would cause the engine to mount the rails, and as she did so, her pinion would also lift clear, causing it to lose all of its brakes. The engine, however, would continue and gather speed going down the hill. The driver and fireman would jump clear and the two coaches would end up being halted by their automatic brakes. However, the engine would plummet about 2,000 feet landing in a valley far below. As you can see here, completely wrecked. Following this, the guard would apply his brakes and shout for everyone to remain where they are, but two people would jump from the train. One of them, whose name was Ellis Roberts, would end up hitting his head on a rock and dying in the hospital. As the locomotive would fall, it would end up damaging a telegraph pole. This would knock off all communication between the last station before the summit and the summit itself. Another driver, having waited three quarters of an hour for a clear signal, would start a slow and cautious descent. However, due to a mist, he wasn't able to see very far in front of him, and unfortunately wasn't able to hear anybody's screams to stop. Thankfully, going at a low speed, the locomotive would hit the two coaches from the previous train and send them rolling into a town, unfortunately still with passengers inside. Upon reaching the town, the coaches themselves would be derailed in a loop by a signalman. Hospital staff arrived almost immediately on scene and Ellis Roberts was carried down the mountain on a stretcher. The engine crews and staff would walk back down, leaving the locomotives and three coaches on the mountain. Lattice was never replaced and her number was never used for any other engine. Services would be suspended for another year until the track was repaired and the railway would reopen on April 16th in 1897. And thankfully since this, the railway has operated without major incident. Due to Lattice being in the shape that she was in, not a whole lot could be done for her, so instead they decided to use any parts that they could for spares for other locomotives. Unfortunately, that would be all that would become of the locomotive itself. I always felt that it was a shame that the Coldy Fell Railway never made it outside of the RWS series. The overall and unique design of the engines make them memorable, and you'd think since they're memorable that they'd be marketable too, but Mattel's not really known for hitting it on the nail. The fact that these engines only exist in the books is sad, but in a way I guess I'm just happy that we actually have them. When the miniature engines came back around, I thought there was a chance that we would see the CGI rendition of Coldy Fell at some point, but at the rate we're going now, I, I really doubt it's gonna happen. So yeah, it sucks, the only thing that we ever got from these engines was these story books, but at least these stories have a genuine in substance, as most RWS stories do. You can be impressed by the engines, or you could just fall into the stories, which all around in the Coldy Fell Railway are quite unique. If you're a Thomas fan and you haven't read the Mountain Engine stories, I highly recommend that you do. If you haven't, you're missing out on some really good storytelling and some really unique characters. And while this may be all we ever get for the Coldy Fell Railway, honestly I think it's enough. He didn't dare look at what was coming next. There was the station master's house. The station master was about to have breakfast. Horrors, cried Thomas, and shut his eyes. The house rocked, broken glass tinkled, plaster was everywhere. Comes to Breakfast is a classic Thomas and Friends story, and it really is one of those episodes that's unforgettable. Thomas, being overly confident, brags to Percy and Toby that he doesn't need a driver or fireman, something that Percy and Toby don't take very kindly to, but regardless of this, Thomas still looks to prove such to them. Thomas ends up waking up before Percy and Toby the next morning, and with his fire already partially started, Thomas sets off on his own, without anybody inside of his cab. At first, everything is easy going, but Thomas soon realizes that he can't brake, and as he continues down the line, he realizes that he's on a collision course with the station master's house, who at the time was having breakfast with his family. Thomas, being unable to stop, closes his eyes and braces for impact, and inevitably ends up running face first through the station master's window, thus ruining the family's breakfast. 
Thomas is scolded by not only the station master, but his wife as well, who naturally is upset that Thomas ruined her breakfast. She doesn't seem to care much about the house, though. And Thomas is then pulled out by Donald and Douglas, who, of course, crack some jokes at him. And Thomas is then brought back to the sheds where he's scolded again by Sir Topham Hatt. There's really not a lot to the story as a whole, but nonetheless, the story stands out as one of the most iconic in the Thomas and Friends series. Not to mention, it's somewhat of a fan favorite, and is especially one of my favorite episodes. So much so that I customized my old G-Scale Thomas to look like he was from this episode. Take the hint, Bachman, please take the hint. As most of you probably already know, this is a classic Reverend W. Audrey story, and because of this, there is some real-life basis behind the story itself. And the information that I was able to find for this story is, to say the least, intriguing. I mean, such an incident seems so perfect for Thomas and Friends. To know that such actually happened in real life is honestly kind of funny. That and how similar the episode and the actual events are are actually pretty uncanny. I think after hearing what I have prepared for you guys today, I'm almost certain that you guys will be able to agree with me in saying that. So, without further ado, let's get into the true and real-life story of Thomas Comes to Breakfast. The locomotive that was involved in the incident itself bears a striking resemblance to Thomas. And like Thomas, this event actually comes from the LBSC railway. The engine was an 062 Billington tank that was stationed at the New Cross Shed during the 1910s. One late evening, the washout gang had been operating one of these engines, and after refilling its boiler, had left its regulator slightly open. This would ultimately go unnoticed by the firelighter, and thus as consequence, the engine numbered 166 had managed enough steam to move on its own. She quietly would end up slipping off from the yard. According to the rules and regulations of the railway, the reverse lever on the locomotive should have been put in mid-gear, but by the general cursedness of things, it of course wasn't. To add insult to injury, the handbrake wasn't screwed on either. No one would actually take notice to the locomotive leaving the yard, as most would assume that it was being moved by the shed driver. The particular line that the locomotive would find itself on would follow the yard down to a hoist, under which engines would be lifted for spring adjustments and so forth. However, because of this, there were no buffer stops. Only the boundary fence and beyond that would be the station master's house. The locomotive would push the fence out of the way with little effort and make itself quite at home in the station master's parlor. The damage the locomotive caused to the house was so severe that it actually had to be propped up before the locomotive could be pulled out. Unfortunately, it's unknown if there was a nagging wife there to make the locomotive feel bad at the scene. How close these events are to the story that the Reverend W would write is honestly kind of shocking. But as I've said before, I really shouldn't be surprised with these true stories. I guess this was just more one that I didn't expect. And truth be told, I don't think I'll be alone in thinking such. Just like I stated before, I was honestly kind of surprised to find a true story in this episode, even though now that I know the facts, it seems pretty realistic. This episode was always one that stuck out to me as a kid, and even now as an adult, it still manages to. Thomas's overall cheeky nature is displayed perfectly in this episode, and the trouble that he finds himself in is overall kind of funny too. It's also great to know that just like in the episode, in the real life events themselves, nobody was actually harmed, and if you've kept up with this series, you know that that's something that's not very common, so it's nice to have a good ending in some capacity. While I don't I don't know what became of the engine itself, I presume that it was pulled out just like Thomas, and hopefully restored back into working order. While it might not be the most crazy or thrilling accident in Thomas and Friends, it will always remain a true classic Thomas and Friends story. It's also great to know that Mattel still appreciates this episode too, so much so that they've actually released a new Thomas Mini to encompass such. Fine, just take my fuck money. So it's definitely not something that's necessarily dead, and now neither is my mini collecting, I'm gonna have to get back on that. Great. But beyond anything, I'm happy to see these classic stories actually getting some recognition. And hopefully now you guys have a little bit more to appreciate whenever you go back and rewatch this classic episode. As always, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. One winter's night, when the cold wind blew, the engines found it hard to sleep. What we need, suggested Toby, is to listen to a story. A mysterious story, said Percy. But, added Duck, it must have a happy ending. Driver told me a story, said Thomas. So everyone listened. Once upon a time, began Thomas. The 
the Mid-Sodor Railway was something that fascinated me as a kid, and how we find out about it is interesting to say the least. For example, in the TV series, when the Mid-Sodor is brought up, oftentimes it's Thomas telling us a story rather than a narrator. Not only that, but the stories themselves are made out to be quite mystifying, and often drive a point home to the other engines. This alone helped to create a sort of maturity in these stories that really stand out when compared to other ones. There's Grandpa, where we find out the sad story of Smudger, a troubled engine who was turned into a generator and put in the back of a shed. There's Bulldog, where Duke saves Falcon from falling off of a cliff, something that definitely would have killed Falcon. And of course, there's Sleeping Beauty, where years after his railway being closed, as well as surviving being literally buried alive, Duke is subsequently found and restored. And these are only some of the stories that the Midsodor has to offer, and really helped to create my personal interest in the subject. I wanted to know what inspired these stories, and after some research into the subject, I was shocked to find real-life inspiration for all three of these episodes, and figured it'd be best to lump it all into one big video, as some of the sources that I was able to find, truth be told, aren't the most intricate, and really wouldn't warrant a video of their own. So, with all that being said, let's get into the true stories of the Midsoto Railway, and what inspired the Reverend W. Audrey to write these stories. To start things off, I figured we'd begin with the most well-known Midsodor story, again being the sad story of Smudger. It's also the smallest source, so oops. During the 1960s, the Reverend W. Audrey would actually pay a visit to the Festoing Railway, the real-life inspiration for the Midsodor and Narrow Gauge Railway. At the time of this visit, one of the locomotives known as Palmerston was being used temporarily as a stationary boiler. What's interesting to me is the locomotive looks a lot more like Duke, but the inspiration that the Reverend W. would take here is pretty clear. That, and as we all know, there were other plans for Duke. It's fun to think about if him and Smudger switched places but I'm honestly happy it's not so. Next on the list, we have Bulldog. Remember the story where Duke saves Falcon's you know, life, you remember, comes from an event that took place on September 5th in 1962, also taking place on the same railway as before. The locomotive named Linda, double-heading with Prince, became derailed at Squirrel Crossing. The event itself is now referred to as Linda's Leap. The original illustrations from the RWS are almost a spitting image of what actually happened. And what's interesting to note is the general manager of the railway at that time, a man named Alan Garraway, allegedly swore all participants of the event to secrecy. What good that did for him. The episode also depicts passengers creating a human chain for getting water to Duke so he can continue his rescue. I don't have any pictures of it, but a similar event did happen on the Talon Railway, so it's likely that these two separate events inspired the entire episode and story for the Reverend W. Audrey. Lastly, but definitely not least, is the story of Sleeping Beauty, where basically after many years of being left and forgotten, everyone's like, yeah, we're gonna go save Duke now, and Tom's just like, that's a great idea, and basically they create a search party to go save and rescue Duke, something that they are successful in doing, but by complete accident, as one of the volunteers would fall through the roof on top of Duke. In real life, it would be a Baldwin engine in 1878-442, known as Coronal Church, which would operate on a small line in Brazil. In August 1879, the locomotive was left abandoned, as the EFFM line, which at the time only spanned 6 kilometers, would abandon the project, as most work crews would succumb to malaria. This, however, would not be the end of the locomotive, which would then be used by local villagers as not only a henhouse, but a bakery oven and a water tank. Eventually, however, fate would see that the locomotive was abandoned in the jungle again, and upon being located, it was found that in the time that it was abandoned, a tree had sprouted from its funnel, vegetation would sprout from the firebox, and insects would make their home inside of its cab, leaving the locomotive in a sorry state to say the least. The discoverers of the locomotive would have it hauled to a new depot, where mechanics would take it to hand to repair the locomotive. It would return to regular service for nearly a quarter of a century, which honestly is probably a record for a locomotive that was lost for more than 30 years, and such really is deserved as number 12 was actually the first locomotive to operate on the railway in the Amazon, and though it took the better part of 30 years, it's good to see that this locomotive finally got what it deserved, and just like Duke, was saved from a fate that could have been a lot worse. Like I stated before, the Mitsoto Railway has always been fascinating to me, and now that I've been able to go back and find out all of this extra information, such is even more true, as I've argued in the past that the narrow gauge engines, as well as their stories, have a much more dark tone, and in a lot of ways these true stories help to highlight that, and definitely helps to explain why these stories feel so much darker. I wish more stories about the Mitsoto were made and especially adapted, but with the couple that we were able to get, the picture of the Mitsoto is painted almost perfectly, and definitely helped to inspire me as a child, not only through my own storytelling, but showing me how in depth the universe of Thomas and Friends really is, and finding out what inspired the person that inspired you really did help to add to my personal interest, and hopefully I did the same with you guys. If there's any other episodes you guys think I should check out, be sure to let me know down in the comments. And thank you to everybody who suggested me to do an episode on the Midsodor, as you guys really did help me find the motivation to do such, and I really couldn't be happier that I did. Hopefully you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next one.
James is buffered. The engines swayed and lurched. At last, got him, he shouted. He pulled the noose tight. Gently braking, Edward's driver checked the engine speed, and James's fireman scrambled across and took control. Old Iron is another classic Thomas and Friends episode, one that sticks out not only to me but to most Thomas and Friends fans as well, as what exactly happens in this episode is unordinary to say the least. And to explain what I mean by that, two kids literally hop onto James's footplate, mess with his controls, and send him down the line as a runaway train. And what do you think they do to stop that said runaway? Well, you probably already know. They send Edward after James at full speed, and from their attempt to lasso his buffer, to not only slow James down but to get a crew onto him to stop him completely. And as we know, Edward is successful in doing just that. And after some praise from Sir Topham Hat, the day is officially saved and everything ends up alright, just as a quick recap. And now that we have what we do know out of the way, what may be a shocker to some people is that this event actually happened, or at least is based off of real life events. Since I've started the True Story series, Old Iron has been one of the most requested episodes, and admittedly I didn't think there even was a true story behind it. But after consulting the Thomas and Friends database, as well as after doing a bit more research, I was able to find an event that parallels this quite well. And though, as you'll see, not every detail matches up, I still feel as if this particular event is at least credible. And of course, that's what we're going to get into today. Apologies for it taking so long, but without further ado, let's get into what I think could be the real-life inspiration for Old Iron. This particular event would take place in Alton, Illinois, and from the small clipping from the Railway Gazette is dated August 1st, 1947. The small clipping titled Railroad Rodeo details that a railway engine started out on its own. How? No one knows, from the yards at Alton, Illinois the other day. Traffic was diverted out of its way along all main lines, and 25 miles down the tracks, another engine waited on the side until the runaway passed. Then, driver Robert Tipple and his crew gave chase and gradually caught up. With some extreme maneuvering, Tipple held his engine sufficiently close enough for the crew to couple the two together. With the runaway quote-unquote lassoed, just like the cowboys rope a steer, members of the crew climbed aboard and shut off the runaway's power. By that time, it had traveled over 50 miles. So, while no actual lasso was used, you can see where the term and possible inspiration may have come from. Truth be told, this event sounds more like Unstoppable than it does Old Iron. And while the clipping itself may be small, the story itself doesn't end here, as members of the Real Life's database were actually able to get an interview with a witness of this event. And that's what I'd like to read to you guys now. It starts off with saying, I'm looking for more information about the capture of a runaway locomotive that took place at or before 1954, near Alton, Illinois. It was apparently noted in the Daily Express and reprinted in the Railway Gazette in the UK in 1954. The apparently driverless locomotive was captured when the pursuing engine caught up along the side, whereupon a railway man stood on the pursuing engine's footplate and managed to harness a loop of heavy rope around the fleeting engine's front buffers. The rescue engine then gradually applied the brakes until both were stopped. Now might also be a good time to mention that the clipping was found after this interview, so that explains why he's following more directly what happens in the episode. They would soon get a response from Bill Dunbar, a retired train dispatcher, who actually worked on the railroad that this would take place on, on the GM&O, and he would have this to say in response. I do indeed remember that incident, and must say the account cited above sounds as if a Hollywood screenwriter reworked the details. The runaway engine was a diesel switcher, one of the GM&O's Alco S2s. Northward freight train number 28 had passed Godfrey, a junction north of Alton and part of the Alton switching district. I'm not sure at this late date, but believe the switcher probably followed 28 up the hill from Juan, a rather commonplace move back then. It was left unattended for a short time within the interlocking limits when, shortly before 3pm, it began to move and entered the northward main track. This was reported to Jim Simons, the first trick train dispatcher at Bloomington. Second trick dispatcher, Elmer Cooney Lakin, had just arrived to relieve him, and Jim was only too happy to vacate the chair. Elmer gave the telegrapher at Brighton Tower a message for number 28, telling them that the runaway was following. When the wild engine passed Brighton, it was possible to estimate its speed, which wasn't too terribly fast, and a message was hooped up to 28 at Shipman with the information. 28's engineer regulated his speed to a little less than that of the runaway, which then gradually narrowed the gap. When it came into sight, 28's conductor was able to advise his engineer by radio what was happening, and in a short time the switcher tied into 28's caboose. The flagman jumped across and shut the runaway's throttle. 28's engineer stopped the train and the escapade was over. No damage was done, except that that dispatcher Lakin soon came down with a case of shingles as a result of the stress caused. From that time, it was mandatory that diesel engines could not be left idling unattended, unless the reverser handle was removed from the control stand. That was more than 60 years ago, so my recollection may not be 100% accurate, but it's a lot more than that story from England. And with that, we have the real-life counterpart to Old Iron from someone who was actually there. 
While this event involved Auk OS2s rather than British steam locomotives, the inspiration is still clearly there. And while the events of the episode may play out a bit differently, the peril that must have been shared in both situations is almost identical. And part of me feels like that's more what Audrey was going for rather than trying to recreate this event detail for detail with his locomotives. And after having both stories, personally I can say he did a damn good job at this. The real ending to the interview is quite wholesome, as they would actually end up sending that small clipping to Bill Dunbar, where he would not only express his thanks, but promise to share it with other old timers who had remembered the incident, giving him and possibly several others a good memory to look back on. And if I'm honest, it's these kind of stories that I really look for in the true story databases. While it's true that train wrecks are often horrible and lives are often lost in them, hearing about an event where teamwork would negate that not only is a lot nicer to read about, but I also feel as if drives home that Thomas and Friends point a little bit more. A story where teamwork and determination stop what could be a horrible accident fits perfectly in the Thomas and Friends world, and converting an event like this into a children's story, especially if the real event has a happy ending, would be and was a piece of cake for Audrey to write. And as these episodes commonly leave me, once again I'm impressed with the Reverend for being able to do such, and now I have even more respect and appreciation for this episode that I grew up watching, and hopefully you guys do too. Before I go, I also wanted to explain and apologize again for not uploading yesterday, as recently I had a family member pass and as such have been occupied with that. And while admittedly things like this are always hard to deal with and especially sad, I can't thank you guys enough for all the support that you guys have shown during this time, and I don't want you guys to think for a second that it goes unheard. Anytime I find myself in a rut or just down recently, I've been able to depend on you guys to help bring me back up again, and this situation has been no different. Not only does it help to keep a smile on my face, but also motivates me to keep going with this content that I make. And no matter how stressful full it gets, it's amazing to know that you guys have my back. I truly can't thank you guys enough for everything that you've done, and I can't wait to pay you guys back with even more of this content that I love making. So, with all that being said, not only thank you to you guys for watching, but thank you to you guys for everything that you do, and be sure you're keeping your all's heads up too. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next one. This concludes our broadcast day. Thanks for watching Adult Swim. Good morning. Welcome to your favorite place for your favorite shows. Cartoon Network.